with me today. It is a great honor to have him today with us. He is professor of practice at uh, School of Governance and Society. He has uh, more than uh, 30 years of experience with academic teaching and learning. Even if you look at the picture that is being shown in the, in the flyer, you would see the book in his hand. So that shows the connection he has with, um, with academia. Today, the topic uh, which is under discussion is neoliberalism, its historical roots and its impact on Pakistani society. So over to uh, Mr. Rahatulain, would you please like to explain us what neoliberalism is and how it is impacting our society? Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you. Um, about 40 years ago, a new social order was imposed on the world, known as neoliberalism. And simply put, it is a, a restoration of the rule of the markets and a reduced role of the state. The free market acts in line with its own interests and with little consideration for salaried workers and the masses of the world population. The state's role is to enforce this new social order. Free circulation of goods and capital at a world level is ensured, and the role of the international financial institutions, such as the IMF, becomes crucial to facilitate this. Neoliberalism in general remains an abstraction. Uh, since countries such as USA, Europe, Japan, China, or any country in the periphery still represent quite distinct social frameworks. Second, neoliberalism is part of the system of imperialism by which the rich and the powerful countries subject the rest of the world to a process of exploitation. Now you ask what it is, what neoliberalism is. It is now uh, cannot be described as a model of development. It must be seen as a new social order, the purpose of which was the restoration of the income and wealth of the upper fraction of the ruling classes. But it is necessary to explain how this restoration was performed. And when we go to its roots, where it started 40 years ago, then it will become even clearer what it really does to the societies, the social order does to the society. The first 9-11 occurred in 1973. People uh, mostly uh, are familiar with the 9-11 of 2001, but the first 9-11 occurred in 1973 in Chile. The CIA and the US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger supported General Augusto Pinochet to topple the democratically elected President Salvador Allende in septem on September 11 in 1973. That was the first 9-11. Around 50,000 people were detained and all made to disappear. Tens of thousands were tortured and killed. And this military coup made way for the first great experiment of neoliberal state formation in the history of the world. The world was in a serious recession at that time in 1973, economic recession. Something had to be done to revive the global economy. So that is how the first great experiment began 40 years ago. Milton Friedman, the famous economist, he's also a uh, Nobel Prize winner. He was teaching at that time in the University of Chicago. A few bright economists called the Chicago Boys were enlisted to remodel the Chilean economy. And with their faith in the free market, they privatized the public assets. 
opened up natural resources to private exploitation, facilitated FDI or foreign direct investment and free trade. Foreign companies became free to repatriate profits from their Chilean operations. Export-led growth replaced import substitution. The Chilean, Chilean economy registered a short-term revival as a result of all this. High growth rate, capital accumulation, and high rates of return on foreign investment provided ev evidence of success of the neoliberal experiment. So it was considered successful when uh, the uh, democratically elected government was toppled, a military dictator Pinochet came in, and all this happened. They thought that this experiment led to, and it was evident, it led to growth, capital accumulation and high rates of return in foreign investment. And it provided evidence of success of the neoliberal experiment. This evidence was going to be used later to remodel the economies of Britain under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. She ruled from 1979 to 90, 1990, which means the entire 80s decade. And in the US also under President Reagan, who was president from 1981 to 1989. Again, coinciding with Margaret Thatcher's rule in Britain, it was the 80s decade when it happened in the central uh, parts of the world, Britain and the US. The violent method which was adopted for Chile was not found suitable for Britain and US. So consent had to be constructed. The social democratic state in, in Europe and the Keynesian compromise between the rich and the salaried class in the US was working well during 1950s and 1960s. A period characterized by high productivity and rising wages resulting from redistributed public policies, control over free capital movement, public expenditure and social welfare state building. This was what was happening after the Second World War in 1950s and 1960s. And that period is known by the economists and the social scientists. It is called the golden period of capitalism. But then a period of stagflation in Europe and USA was set in and the top 1% of the income earners made less money. And this happened before these uh, neoliberal experiments were carried out in, you know, uh, in Chile. So uh, I have taken some quotes from Dumenil and Levy's work on neoliberalism. Uh, and I quote here, before World War II, these households, the top 1%, received 16% of total income. This, percent, this percentage fell rapidly during the war. And in the 1960s, it had been reduced to 8% a plateau which was maintained during the three decades, 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. In the mid 80s, it soared suddenly, and by the end of century, it reached 15%. So the crisis, the economic crisis, the world was facing in the, in the 70s, encroached on the wealth of the wealthiest, and neoliberalism arose as a response to this threat to the rich. The traditional individual or family ownership of the means of production at the turn of the 19th and 20th century gave way to a new framework in which ownership in the strict sense and management were separated. The company was owned by somebody else and it was run by someone else 
managed by someone else ownership now was articulated by the holding of securities stocks shares bonds loans which is known by the economists as the financialization of the economy so ownership was now articulated by holding of securities and by that token can be described as financial management of the actual corporation on the other hand was ensured by managers with with the help of employees their task now their tasks are geared not to collective production but to birds the maximization of the profits the state is the institution in which the overall powers of the ruling classes is embodied it allows these classes to rule collectively in this sense the state is never an autonomous body separate from these classes even within democracies the power of the state is never independent from the oligarchic oversight now you those who have studied a bit of uh, economics um and in its historical perspective they would know that the keynesian managerial compromise was a broad compromise with large fractions of salaried workers uh finance was to some extent repressed in the uh, in the sense that its comparative power income and wealth had been diminished since the great depression and the second world war during the years of the keynesian compromise management had gained a considerable autonomy from the owners the owners of enterprises this was the case within the large corporations but also within the state apparatus while policies were defined with specific objectives such as growth and full employment alien to ownership thus the keynesian uh, compromise could be more appropriately labeled as a managerial compromise so neoliberalism is the social order that emerged from the destruction of this earlier social compromise between the keynesian uh, dispensation and the salaried workers and which entails the restoration of power of the finance to the owners so this uh, world was in serious recession and when something had to be done milton friedman of chicago university and a few bright economists called the chicago boys were enlisted to remodel the chilean economy and they did what i have just described and which was then later replicated in britain and in the us by margaret thatcher and president reagan during the 80s decade that is where it took root the thatcher uh, government strengthened it on this side of the atlantic and president reagan on that side thatcher used to say there is no alternative for short tina t i n a there is no alternative to this that is what she meant and she also used to say there is no society only individuals reagan he on the other side used to say government is the problem so reduce the role of the government and let the markets play however they want to do it these two practically ushered in the neoliberal era on both sides of the atlantic ocean and prescribed it for the rest of the world it's a philosophy so to speak which was patented in a kind of written charter by the english economist john williamson and if you want to uh, understand its uh, details of what it really meant the williamson document later became known as washington consensus which you should read 
if you are interested in really understanding what neoliberalism does to the countries, and well, we will come to Pakistan uh, in a short while and see how it is uh, doing it, um, what impact it is having on Pakistani society. But the Washington consensus prepared the, the groundwork on which was based the spread of neoliberalism later. And the three entities among which this consensus was formed were the IMF, the World Bank, and the US Treasury Department. And briefly, to make it simple for you to understand, because it is quite complicated. And it is complicated because it is not discussed and not taught and not, uh, therefore not understood in Pakistan. All these three entities shared the view, typically labeled neoliberal, neoliberal view, that the operation of the free market and the reduction of the state involvement were crucial to development in the global south, which includes Pakistan. And what were these rules of the Washington Consensus? Very simply put, these rules encourage governments to adopt policies that make way for marketization, deregulation, liberalization, reduction of the state's role in provision of services to the people, removal of subsidies, regressive taxation policy, and privatization. All this put together, the Washington consensus, or in other words, neoliberalism, is euphemistically called freedom. And here I quote George W. Bush, and the quote starts like this. Freedom is the almighty's gift to every man and woman of this world. And as the greatest power on earth, we have an obligation to spread freedom. The American president, George W. Bush, he said that when US invaded Iraq in 2003. So they were going there to spread freedom. And what did the word freedom mean? The answer was provided by Paul Bremer head of the Coalition Provisional Authority in his order issued on 19th September, 2003. And this is what he wrote. Full privatization of public enterprises, full ownership rights by foreign firms of Iraqi business, full repatriation of foreign profits, and opening of Iraq's banks to foreign control, national treatment for foreign companies, and the elimination of almost all trade barriers. The right to unionize and strike was restrained and a highly regressive flat tax was imposed. Neoliberal policies have been applied to much of the world in the past generation with bad effects and in the weaker societies with devastating effects. So instead of uh, going further on this, uh, the theoretical and historical background. Let me now, because we have uh, reached uh, 1130 mark, come to Pakistan. Pakistan has come a long way. We should not uh, completely downgrade or Pakistan bashing is quite a favorite pastime by social scientists. So let's not do start with that. But the country's population in itself uh, shows that there is some growth. It was 35 million at the birth of the country. Now it is 200 plus million. Literacy rate was 11% at the time of independence. Now it is 58%. Size of its GDP is rising according to World Bank and according to 2017, barring the uh, low growth or negative growth uh, of the past six months because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Pakistan was among those countries that are worst hit by the economic shocks 
but it was sustained and it was helped by its resilient youth and informal economy in some ways now we will take for the next 10 or 10 minutes or so just one sector on which the impact of neoliberalism will be explained and then you can see how it has impacted the institutions uh, which we have which deal with food and food security are ministry of food agriculture and livestock in islamabad and under the 18th constitutional amendment the functions of this ministry have been devolved uh, in June 2011. So food is the sector which we will see how it is faring under neoliberal policies. We have a centrist uh, government system and a new ministry of national food security and research was established by the government on October 2011 after the devolution. Um, under the 18th Amendment. These are the institutions. There is a national food security policy of 2018. And one of the claims of this policy is that Pakistan produces 52.6 million tons of milk every year, which puts it among the leading milk producers. Some people say fifth largest milk producer in the world. And others say third largest producer of milk in the world. So now, how does neoliberalism impact milk production or food in general? We are able to drink our own milk and we send millions of dollars for drinking our own milk to Switzerland. The same can be said about water. We drink our own water and we send millions of dollars every month to Switzerland for drinking our own water. And why is it happening? because um, we espouse the neoliberal policy of attracting foreign investment. And the foreign investment in the food sector brought in Nestle. Nestle is the largest food company of the world. It is uh, headquartered in Switzerland. And now it makes us drink our own water, our own milk, our own juices, etc and we pay all pakistanis who are drinking milk and water uh, out of nestle bottles we are paying them to take away our wealth our income to their country whereas uh, about 40 years ago before neoliberalism was introduced in the world the same water our uh, ladies of the house used to boil, put it in the fridge and used to drink. And there was nothing wrong with that water. But we can't do it now. Under the neoliberal import regime, we can't do it. Or investor protection regime, we can't do it. Now there is uh, in the food security policy, there is a uh, clause which says enhancement of duties on import of cheaper dry milk powder will be imposed. This is our food security policy. I'm reading from that. This is a direct quotation. Enhancement of duties on import of cheaper dry milk powder in order to protect the local dairy industry. Now, what we have done with the local dairy industry by introducing Nestle is a different story. But this, uh, this desire on part of the government to enhance duties on import of milk goes against neoliberal philosophy. So 
So we couldn't do it. It's written, it is there, but we couldn't do it. You can find Nido, you can find uh, Milak, any kind of imported milk anywhere in the supermarkets. So this is something which our policymakers just do not understand what, when they say, for instance, that uh, the roti cannot be sold for more than six rupees or seven rupees, they are completely forgetful of the neoliberal free market principle. It just can't be done. You just can't go to different places selling rotis and stop them from selling at 12, 10 or 15 rupees per roti. You just can't do that. It will go against the principle of neoliberalism. So saying that uh, things have become very expensive and this is talking without understanding why this is happening. Why this kind of thing uh, happens. Now I'll just give you one example and then I'll stop because there is so much that we can talk about but neoliberalism action in action in Pakistan by the government, uh, those people who make decisions. Um, on 9th October last year, about a year ago, the Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce and Industry held a symposium on biotechnology and food security. So we are discussing the impact of neoliberalism on the sector, food sector only at this time, but there are it has impacted all social sectors. Advisor to the Punjab chief minister made the following remarks in that symposium. And I quote, this is what I noted down, very significant. He said, the Punjab government strategy includes A, increasing the size of the agri-economy from US dollars 40 billion to US dollars 100 billion. B, agri productivity to be increased fourfold with Chinese assistance. C, expansion of canal irrigation network. D, conservation of water. E, crop value chain development through R&D with Chinese assistance. And then he added, and this is significant. What he added, government can't do it. Private sector will do it. His words, not, not mine. In effect, the 18th amendment means devolving governance, not to the provinces, but to the private sector. And that is neoliberalism in action. So if the prices go up, if foreign companies get rich and we pay them to get rich, no surprise. So I will stop here and uh, because it was uh, something which we do not talk about normally in Pakistan. It's not uh, discussed in conferences. No, not many papers. There are some papers that are written, um, but very few. So therefore it is not clearly understood. So I will allow the uh, audience now to ask questions. Before I stop, I must acknowledge that uh, I have, uh, um, although there is some uh, research involved, which I have done myself, uh, especially about Pakistan, but on the historical roots, uh, I, I have benefited from David Harvey's work on this and there were some other uh, scholars whose work is available for, for those who are interested to read more about neoliberalism and understand it because it is impacting our lives and it is impacting our lives in a way that we do not really understand when, uh, because it's not discussed. It's just not discussed anywhere what neoliberalism is doing to the Pakistani society, 
and therefore it is uh, it remains uh, under wraps so to speak so i'll stop <clears throat> sir would you like to um, give us some suggestions how we can prevent ourselves from from the destruction of uh, neoliberalism is there a way because when we talk about the capitalism we believe that um, the companies are growing and it's about capitalism so it, th this is how economics work but is it a way or is it a solution that you could suggest that we should be doing if we want to um, minimize the the effects of neoliberalism in our society hmm. yes uh, this is the obvious question i was expecting somebody will ask it and you have done it um see in in our uh, public policy debates and in our government uh, government uh, circles there is a a, a very irresistible desire for people to ask this question what is the solution and that also is a um, it happens uh, during our research projects as well that we do some research and then we find uh, at the end a solution what is the solution as if this research or this um, presentation or this conference or whatever the activity intellectual activity uh, can provide a solution this is uh, a kind of uh, making oneself or putting oneself in an extremely important position that what i am going to suggest will solve the world's problems so that is something which uh, with which i will start that it's not so simple that i suggest something and uh, the problem will be solved but then there are some things which uh, people have done in the world and they have insulated themselves from the ravages of or the de devastation caused by neoliberal uh, dispensation and the governance model which was introduced by by milton friedman uh, washington consensus thatcher and reagan and so on um, it is uh, the first thing that we need to understand is that this is the dominant system everywhere in the world and almost all countries have adopted it except a few um according to the uh, oxfam um there are well let us not uh, discuss oxfam because that will further complicate it but uh, um there are some countries who have not adopted neoliberal policies and they have been insulated by uh, by doing that one of them is uh, china there is no uh, neoliberal dispensation in in china they have adopted a completely different policy which they say is uh, according to their own uh, narratives it's called uh, the economic solution or the economic uh, uh, policies with chinese characteristics some times they call it socialism with chinese characteristics and at other occasions they call it capitalism with chinese characteristics so uh, that is one uh, example a big one in the world where neoliberalism has not touched the society um there are other examples but now you asked how we can in pakistan for instance what we can do we can't do what the china has chinese uh, have done um they have adopted a system which we cannot we we are 
uh, it's impossible. Those who say that the example of China should be followed, we should learn from them, they don't learn anything from China because they don't know uh, what the Chin Chinese uh, system is and how it works. So if we do not know something, how can we say we should learn from it? So we can't. But there are other things. For instance, in Italy, there is a, a region, Italy is divided in 20 regions. Probably you know that. Uh, one of the regions is called Emilia Romagna. Emilia Romagna is a, a very large region. Bologna is the capital of that region. And 40% of the socio-economic system of that country, uh, of that region, is completely insulated from neoliberal dispensation. It's, it's unaffected. Um, it is worth studying such examples in, in the world. What they have done, how they have insulated themselves, and how they have then managed their own economic and social life without subjecting itself to the ravages of neoliberalism. It's a, uh, again, like I uh, tried to explain, not completely successful, but tried to explain what neoliberalism is, how it started and what are its uh, contours in the same way. Um, the economic dispensation of Emilia Romagna need to be studied by us in order to understand what they have done. And that would require another uh, 30 minute session to explain what they, what they have done. They have simply um, requested the state to leave them alone. And they have uh, modeled their own uh, social life and their own economic life and their governance by themselves. Um, in Pakistan, if you want to find examples where some kind of uh, um, insulation from neoliberal uh, dispensation is visible, then you should uh, go to Orangi pilot project in Karachi, Khudaki Basti in Karachi. And these are communities who have uh, created uh, a, a governance model and a socio-economic system, which is more or less, not completely, but more or less insulated from uh, the state intervention. And they are doing well. They are successful. The Orangi pilot project is modeled on the uh, Pomila uh, project of Dr. Akhtar Hamid Khan. Um, and uh, the Khudaki Basti was started by a retired bureaucrat, Tasneem uh, Siddiqui Saab. Um, it is thriving, it is working. They have their own in Karachi, you see, uh, because of uh, various problems, neoliberalism is just one. Pakistan has many other problems. So we are just discussing one. Uh, we have feudalism, we have a uh, system, we have an informal economic system, who do not pay taxes, and we have so many other complications. So in Karachi, the water supply is not in the, it's a public service which should be provided by the state to the citizens, but it's not in the hands of the states. It's uh, the tankers who supply water at a cost to all residents. But in the OPP, Orangi Pilot Project, they have their own water and they have their own water cleaning system. They, uh, if you go there, you will find that at 
every uh, about uh, 500 yards, they have a reverse osmosis RO plant uh, on top of some building. And that is supplying clean water, clean drinking water to the people there. Same in Khodaki Basti. Their storage system, their cleaning system, and their water supply system is all built by themselves. So it is uh, the community-based solutions that can um, mitigate some of the problems caused by neoliberalism. And the community-based systems uh, are not, these are just two examples. There are more in Pakistan. And those can be uh, searched if you like. You can find them um, uh, on the net. There are many uh, different ways in which people have uh, done for themselves what the state has not been able to do for them. So it's not simple, you know. Um, I, I was reminded with your question, by your question, I was reminded of a of a, uh, a presentation which was made by someone to the chief minister about five, six years ago um, in the Punjab government. And uh, it was 75 slides that he wanted to show. So when he came on the fifth or sixth slide, the chief minister lost his patience and he said, so you see, uh, the problem, another problem with our policy makers is that we don't want to know the causes of the problem. We just want to jump to the conclusion, to the solution, and that makes for very poor, ill-based, ill-informed public policy. We don't know why some problem has existed in, in, in Punjab, for instance. Don't want to know. We don't have time to know it. Our uh, rulers don't have time to know what is causing a problem. They just want to know. So this is a problem that we have. But again, you know, the solutions come later. The first step is to understand why things are not as they should be. And when we know the cause of the problem, then we will be able better, in a better position to find a solution for it. Hmm. Any other question from the audience? Uh, I would like to um, perhaps make a comment. Um, uh, first of all, um, a really uh, a wonderful presentation. Um, I was uh, conceptually aware of some of the um, ideas, but uh, not uh, specifically. So thank you so much for providing uh, examples of what happened in Chile. Um, and then the models in Italy and, and then uh, uh, the, the implementation of something similar uh, in some Pakistani communities. So um, uh, already I see hope um, that no matter what the situation is and no matter how powerful um, uh, certain um, you know, groups might be in the world, uh, but there are always uh, solutions, there are always ways out of it. Uh, so, so the idea of self-sufficiency uh, of uh, societies, uh, uh, you know, coming together and coming up with a solution and not simply relying on the government or someone uh, outside of them to implement, I think that is a fantastic idea. And... Uh, uh, at a very local level, <laughs> interestingly, uh, in, in the community where, where I'm residing currently, uh, you know, practically everybody, for example, uh, is concerned about the quality of milk that is delivered to our homes. Every single home is talking about it, uh, but they don't 
consider that they, they, you know, as many people as there are, let's say in this particular community, that they could simply come together and fund a farm and ensure good quality milk being delivered to their homes for their families. So my, I guess, question is that how can we, um, uh, because this, uh, like you were saying, that Thatcher was pushing the agenda of uh, individualization over the society. So that has crept in into Pakistan as, as much that everybody uh, by themselves, by their own. Uh, and the, the sense of community and society is disappearing. Uh, you know, you don't know your next door neighbors and they don't want to know you either. Uh, and then how are we going to uh, come on a, on the same page? Uh, uh, you know, if you're not even communicating and so, so the quick question is that how do we, uh, perhaps through the syllabus, through the curriculum, uh, bring people back as they're talking about one national curriculum. Uh, I think that is the area where uh, we can introduce these topics and uh, try to uh, make people realize that if they don't uh, at least attempt to take charge of their destinies, then they will always be controlled by this policy or that policy forever. So, so uh, not that it's a direct solution, but I think uh, having the, the concept of self-sufficient communities as much as possible, I think that should be looked at. Communities can um, uh, get together and build solar grids. Uh, they can... Um, uh, build uh, many farms, you know, even for vegetables and and dairy and so on. So I don't know if it's more of a comment or, or a question, but if you could reflect on that, sir, briefly. Well, I think uh, this uh, self-managed uh, or self-run uh, community, um, I gave you the example of uh, the region in Italy Emilia Romagna. So if uh, somebody is interested to, to understand how they have done it, and that is uh, within a neoliberal dispensation. Italy, uh, the entire Europe, uh, although there is still some vestiges of welfare state left there, although social democracy is uh, almost dead, but still there is something. Uh, under that neoliberal dispensation, they have been able to create a, 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 an enclave where they can self-manage themselves, their society is robust, they remain uh, insulated from the, the shocks of recession, mostly, and uh, they, uh, they do much better than the outside Italian population does. So now uh, that might provide you some, some light, but uh, what I presented was quite a dark picture. And uh, we always uh, say, be positive, but uh, there is though there are those people who see light even with, with this darkness. And one of them is Amritya Sen. Uh, although he is, he also explores poverty, uh, justice, um, inequality, and so on. But he is uh, a, a Nobel uh, laureate economist, best known for his powerful essays on famine. He believes that the world has resources to feed those who are starving. He's an optimist and uh, in general, he's an optimist. He believes that the reason and voluntary participation are two things, reason and voluntary participation. This, these two things that can help humanity fight poverty and hunger. Uh, this is his solution. He is much uh, bigger in stature than uh, than any of the speakers that we come uh, 
in contact, he believes that reason and voluntary participation are two things that can help humanity fight poverty and hunger. And second, and closer to home, if you look for something positive, we have the biotechnology geniuses like Dr. Sh uh, Kossar Abdullah Malik. And if his recommendations were adopted by the government, what Amritya Sen believes could become a reality in Pakistan. So read Amritya Sen and pay heed to what Dr. Kossar Abdullah Malik has to say and you will feel your spirits are lifted. Uh, thank you so much, sir. That uh, reason, um, and I was almost uh, 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 smiling at that word when you said it, <laughs> uh, and, and then volunteership. Um, uh, th th these uh, almost appear to be foreign to uh, foreign concepts, I feel sometimes, yes. in our yes. society. Um, uh, th th there are things happening, um, you know, at, at all levels where uh, it's hard to see, uh, you know, if, if there's any reason behind it. Um, uh, but but I think uh, uh, again the power lies with the people, um, and uh, mashallah, people uh, like you and many other examples that you shared with us. Uh, and what I liked was this idea of research and having an understanding of the issues. Uh, so at many times, uh, no matter you know what we look at. Uh, uh, you know, we are seeing wherever there's an administration, they seem to not have time to even listen to the issues. Um, and the focus is somehow on results. Uh, yes. but they don't have right. the, uh, you know, uh, the patience to at least un understand what the issues are at hand. Because how could you, uh, and, and it really is mind boggling that how could anyone uh, in a leadership position um, be so impatient and running after the results without even understanding deeply what the causes are? Uh, I mean, that is almost uh, scary. <laughs> More scarier than the coronavirus, to be honest. Um, uh, because these kind of things will affect us for many centuries to come. But anyway, very thought-provoking presentation, sir. Thank you. I think it looks like we could continue on for the rest of the day, but I want to make sure other people have a chance to um, contribute as well. Thank you, um, Nanasa, for your um, input. Any other uh, participant who would like to ask a question or uh, would like to leave a comment? All right. <clears throat> with this and uh, with a lot of thought provoking discussion, uh, we come to the end of our session. It's 12.05 already. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Radulan, for your time and that you have taken out from your busy schedule. Um, thank you, and thank you all the participants who have participated in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Allah thank Hafiz. you very much. Thank you, everyone.